the reason I had to introduce this first was collision is the language you, we use to um, describe many different processes. So this one, is, it's clearly collision, right? I take a ball out, and you know, this swing down is not collision, but here, when it strikes this, that you, anyone would describe that as collision, right? So, so let's look at this Newton's cradle and try to answer the question. Why is it that if I move two balls off to the side, and these two balls come in with some speed, then the only thing that can possibly happen out of many different possibilities, either one ball comes out with all the energy, or two balls come out with the same velocity, or you know, even three balls come out with a slower speed. Out of all those different possibilities that will all conserve energy, that the only thing that happens is the same mass comes out with the same speed. Yep. So, so you know, let's uh, since I you know use that to introduce conservation of energy and momentum. Let's uh, you know wrap that up before we move on more. So, Newton's cradle. So this is the picture I have. Um, uh, I'll tr draw the exact picture we have. I have five balls total, and the initial condition I am going to describe is that I have, um, they all have mass n. I have these two balls that are coming in with some speed. Phi naught. Right? And So these will come in and it will undergo collision. And what, what type of collision is it again? Elastic. Elastic collision. So after this collision, it undergo, so it undergoes elastic collision. And what we are looking for is all right, after they undergo elastic collision, what should happen next? So um, we have different possibilities. So if this is the before picture, let me sketch out the after picture. So after picture would be, um, let's uh, specify this much that there will be some clump of mass here that will be at rest. So the after picture will look like this. Ow. I will have some amount of mass here that's going to be at rest, right? And I will have some other amount of mass here that's going to have some final velocity. Um, and I guess if I want to make sure I didn't underspecify the problem, then no, I don't think. Okay, I, I think I can just leave it here. I don't think I. I mean, you know, this is true. M1 plus M2 is 5m, but I don't think I need to specify that. So I will write. I have written it down, but I probably won't be using it. So this is the question that I'm trying to answer. This is the sort of mathematical way to state the same question I've been asking like five, 10 times now. <laughs> um, so in this collision, how many masses should be coming out? And what should be the speed of those masses that are coming out? All right, and you know, the masses that are coming in had a mass of 2m. All right, so um, let's try to answer that. Uh, what tool do we have to try to answer this question? Hmm? We had a uh, well, I'm not going to do the, I've done the experiment many times, so you've seen it. I want to do this analytically, theoretically. So what tool do we have to try to answer these two questions? What problem solving tool do we have? So when you say standard strategy, you mean um, a force problem, right? 
So here's a question. Um, what kind of information are we given about forces here? Almost nothing, right? And when you think about this physical situation, um, I can just imagine that the forces will be complicated. Because, you know, there's a lot of uh, things pushing. So I prefer not to deal with the forces. Uh, Edward. Yeah, so we are going to try to use conservation laws. So, so you know, um, so far your problem solving has been kind of boring, except for maybe kinematics, where it's a matter of, you know, how good are you at uh, uh, word math problems. So, so far your problem solving has been boring because every single problem involved the force in some way, so you use the standard strategy. But when you keep trying to do that, eventually you run into problems that are too complicated, like this one. And um, one of the other problems that you will look at later today is also very too complicated to look at using forces. So conservation laws are your uh, other set of tools to help you navigate through these more complicated issues. Um, so um, Edward said the conservation of, did you say momentum? OK, so can you justify why momentum should be conserved here? That's not the condition for conserving momentum. Yeah? There's no net external force. Uh, as these two things collide, um, so there's tension and there's gravity, uh, but there's tension and gravity, but they balance each other out in this position. So we could have said that as these two things collide, that, um, that you know, the net external force is zero. But here's the thing. You are going to see us do this later. That when two balls are, let's say, colliding in space, so uh, and you know, so right now I'm holding that, but imagine there are projectiles. So like this is dropping and this is coming in and hitting something like this. And I even then, we are going to insist that we can use conservation of momentum. So um, like even in the case where there's clearly external force of, <laughs> even when there's a clearly external force of gravity, we are going to say somehow for this interaction, we are going to say, I know there's that external force, but we are going to ignore it. And that's the refinement of this condition that I want to do now, since we talked about collision. Um, so this is the refinement. Let me just give that to you. So whenever we describe, whenever we describe a particular interaction as collision, uh, we haven't exactly defined what collision is, right? I kind of assumed that you are familiar with what collision is. So we didn't really explicitly define it. Um, but you kind of have a sense that when you see an interaction like this pendulum motion, that that's not a collision, right? And you have this kind of sense that as this comes in, this um, not so this portion is not collision, but this portion is collision. Right? So what one feature would you, other than you know, two things strike each other, what would you use to say one is collision and the other is not? Because you know, if it's a matter of things striking each other, like, um, so I've been describing this as collision, right? Um, these two, you know, colliding. Do they actually strike each other? They don't. But I'm still, for some reason, trying to describe this as a collision. Um, in this case, they actually attract each other, but I'm going to call this also a collision, right? So, yeah, I don't have a limited amount of time. So, what um, the one parameter that's going to be important in me in me being able to describe something as collision is that it's going to be limited in time, limited in the duration of time for the interaction to take place. When you think of this pendulum, the interaction between my hand and the pendulum, it can potentially go on forever. 
for an unlimited amount of time delta t. Whatever interaction we are going to call collision, it's going to have a limited amount of time duration. And um, this is what we are going to say. We are going to say it's limited in time so much that for whatever interaction we are describing as collision, we are going to say this amount of interaction time, it's negligible. It's practically zero. It, so whenever we refer to something as collision, that's an approximation we are making. In fact, uh, one of your homework problem involves uh, like gravitational slingshot or something like that, and the gravitational interaction between a satellite and the planet, it doesn't it involve anything striking anything, and it actually takes a fair amount of time. But when we describe this collision, we are saying that interaction time is so short, um, it's limited enough that I can just uh, collapse all of the interaction with a single moment, do it that way. Okay. So this is, uh, this is something that I want to tell you. Because with the collision, this is limited in duration of time, what you are going to have is with the collision, momentum is almost always conserved. Momentum is almost always conserved in a collision. In fact, if you consider momentum of everything that's interacting, then you can say it's conserved. So for example, you know, when you look at the example of this, uh, this um, golf ball striking the wall, ooh, I don't know if I want to do that. I've never done it. Sure. With the wall, yeah, I think the wall is not strong enough. Let me do this with a tennis ball. <laughs> so you know, when I have this tennis ball striking the wall, then uh, momentum of this tennis ball is clearly changing, right? But if I include the momentum of everything, the wall, which is attached to the building, so the building, which is attached to the earth, so the earth, then total momentum of everything interacting is conserved. So, and this is something that we would describe as collision. So if we include all the interacting objects, then we could even say this. Momentum is always conserved. The only time when momentum is not conserved in a collision would be where you didn't include some of the interacting objects. So, and that will be the case even when there's a clearly friction, like uh, these two cars colliding like this. There's clearly significant friction, right? But we are going to say in this collision, we can ignore friction. And this is how. Remember that change in momentum was this. Change in momentum was given by impulse, right? Yes? <coughs> um, how was the impulse defined? I'm not asking you for the unit of impulse. That's also not unit of impulse. How is impulse defined, Asia? Yeah, force times change in time or duration of time. So force times duration of time. So with the conservation of momentum, it's not actually the forces we care about. It's the moment change in momentum that we care about. So there could be external force. But if we somehow say that the duration of time is going to go to zero without making the external force infinity, then I can say that impulse will go to zero and say that there's no change in momentum, even when there's a finite non-negligible external force. I can set up the condition so that impulse is negligible. So that's going to be the refined statement for conservation of momentum. It happens when, not when net external force is equal to zero, it would be when the net impulse, net impulse due to external force is equal to zero. Okay. 
Um, I, and there's some symmetry with this, because here we were worrying about network, which changes energy, and here we are wor worried about the net impulse, which changes momentum. So, um, so you know, all of this to justify that whenever we say collision, momentum is conserved. You can kind of assume in all these different types of collisions, momentum is conserved. You can take that as given. So, all right, so momentum is conserved. What else is conserved? In this question. So, uh, so let's say I'm going to use conservation of momentum. Let, actually, before we move on, let's uh, finish this line of thought. So OK, uh, following Edward's suggestion, we say momentum is conserved. OK, how do we use that to solve this problem? Like, how do you use conservation laws? Uh, we've done the first step. The first step is you identify conserved quantity and you know, check for conditions to make sure, yes, it is conserved. So we identify the momentum. We check for these conditions to say, all right, momentum is going to be conserved. Once you've done that due diligence, then now you have to finally start you know, writing down some mathematical expressions. What um, type of math? Um, so how do I write down whatever equation I'm going to write down? Like what quantities am I doing? Yeah, Abdi? Momentum uh, before collision is equal to momentum after collision. Yeah. So we are saying momentum is the quantity that doesn't change. So we say momentum, net momentum at some time before is equal to net momentum at some other time after. Yeah. So we can start out with this. Then that the sum of the momentum before collisions is equal to sum of momentums after the collisions. All right, let's uh, write it out. The total momentum before collision, it would be this mass times this velocity, right? So it'll be 2m v0 is equal to uh, final moment, final picture after collision. So here, there's no momentum, right? I just said, you know, some part of the mass will stay at rest. And some part of mass will shoot off. So it'll be this mass times this velocity. So m2 times vf. All right, so here's an equation that hopefully we can use. So here's the question that you should always ask before going any further in solution. Um, do I have enough information? Can I solve this for the quantities I want in terms of completely known quantities? How many unknowns do I have here? Three, I have two. I don't know this mass. I'm trying to figure that out. I don't know this speed. I'm trying to figure that out. So two unknowns, one equation. I don't have enough information. I need to find uh, more information. And in terms of problem solving, that means I need to look for more equations that somehow relate to these and you know, won't be introducing any more unknowns. So Arjun, what other condition do we need? Now, um, but I don't know what M1 is either. So I could use this, but since I don't know M1, um, that using this equation will simply bring in one more unknown. Then I have you know, two equations for three unknowns. Steven, you have a suggestion? So could you know it's elastic of total magnetic Yeah, so we have to, that's why you have to know the vocabulary words. When it says elastic, it's just a different way of saying kinetic energy is conserved. So we are going to have to use conservation of energy as well as conservation of momentum. This is you know, different from the ballistic pendulum problem that you're doing for the lab. For that problem, um, you know, one or the other was conserved. But there are many situations where both are conserved. So where both the momentum is conserved and energy is conserved. So conservation of energy. So we write down the conservation equation also. So what we would say is that the total, um, total. well, in this case, I'm only dealing with the kinetic energy. So I would say the total kinetic energy before the collision is equal to the total kinetic energy after the collision. That's what 
you know, being energy being kinetic energy being conserved means. All right, so um, let's write that down. So before the collision, uh, I have two m moving at the speed of v naught. What was the formula for kinetic energy? Yeah, one half mb squared. So one half times the mass, two m, times the speed, v naught squared. That must equal my final kinetic energy, m two and v final. So one half m two v final squared. Yeah. So we have two equations, two unknowns. Uh, M2 and V not, I mean, so M2 and V final, so it, it must be solvable, right? So let's, let's just solve it and see. Um, I guess, by the way, once you start dealing with the conservation of energy, your algebra has potential to get a little bit complicated. It's because of these squares here. So you want to do, take care when you're doing algebra, you know, try to avoid the situations where you have to use quadratic formula. Um, this is simple enough, so let me do it this way. Um, I will solve the equation one for V final. And doing that will let me plug this in here and solve for M2, hopefully. Hopefully it won't cancel out. Then I will know how, how much mass is getting ejected out of this side in a way that's consistent with the conservation of momentum and energy. Once I know how much mass is getting ejected, then I can figure out the speed using equation one again. Good? Okay, so let me solve this for V final. Um, that shouldn't be too hard. Uh, yeah. So solve this for V final. Then V final is, well, I just divide both sides by M2. So it'll be 2M V naught over M2. Good? Plug this in here. Then uh, let me cancel out, pre-cancel some of the things that will just go away. One half will cancel. Um, I guess that's it. <laughs> so let me plug that in. Then what I have is 2m v naught squared is equal to um, m2 times that whole thing squared. So 2m over m2 squared times v naught squared. Does something cancel here? What cancels? <coughs> well, something simpler. Yeah, that's just uh, I'm looking for v naught. <laughs> I want to cancel v naught first. Right? <laughs> so that, that means whatever result I get doesn't depend on the initial speed of the thing, which is good because you know when I do this, the result doesn't depend on if I uh, pulled out two, a, a little bit or pulled out two a lot. Like the result is the same. So I don't want the result to be dependent on this and it cancels out, good. And uh, let me expand the things out. That'll help me cancel out things without making mistakes. So it'll be 2m equal to m2, whole thing squared here, so divided by m2 squared times, this will be 4m squared, 4m squared. Let me cancel out some of the things that cancel out. Um, so one factor of M2 cancels out this, good. I don't want the entire M2 to cancel out. I only want a little bit of it to cancel out. So I can solve this for M2. Pull M2 over here, divide up by 2M. When you do all that, this is the result you end up with. You end up with um, M2 is equal to 4M squared divided by 2M. That's equal to 2n. That's the result we are looking for. That in this interaction, in order to conserve both the energy and momentum, the only amount of mass that can come out in this collision is two masses. In order to have something different, you'll have to start violating one of these two. You'll have to start violating conservation of energy. If this is completely inelastic collision, then the, you know, all five masses will come out. But as long as energy is conserved here, the only situation that can happen is two masses will come out. 
Yeah? And once you have that, then you know, plug this in here, well then outgoing speed is the same as the incoming speed, so that both the momentum and energy will be conserved. Yeah? Any questions? Yeah, this is a pretty simple situation. Um, I, you know, I, it took us a long time because I was introducing all these things as I was going through this. But this is a pretty simple question as far as uh, questions go. Yes? You change the first two bars as M1 and then the third bar as M2. Um, wait, I wouldn't label it this that way. So the result of this derivation, what it has shown, is that this is um, 2M. So that means this must, the masses that are not moving must be 3M. This is the after picture. I don't want to confuse my after picture with the before picture. But, okay, any questions? Okay, um, so that's it. Um, it's a pretty, so wait. No, this is not the, uh, I guess we did one other one in the lecture before. This is your second example where the physical process conserves both the momentum and energy.